Thanks for tuning in. I wanted to remind you of our Road to 1,000 Subscribers giveaway that we have going on our YouTube channel. If you subscribe and have a public profile, you'll be entered to win a free RX Smart Gear original jump rope. You'll get to pick the pattern of the handles, the color and weight of the cable, and you'll be getting one of the best selling, best performing jump ropes out there. Every time we hit a new century mark with the number of subscribers to our channel, we'll randomly select a new winner. And our friend Dave Newman is going to throw in a little something extra for each winner. So a special thanks to our sponsor, RX Smart Gear, to Dave Newman for being such a great partner, and to you for being a loyal listener. Good luck, and I hope you are our next winner. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. I wanted to talk to you about our new sponsor, Element 26. They are an innovative company producing lots of products around the CrossFit, Strongman, powerlifting space. They have weightlifting belts. They have knee sleeves. They have thumb tape. Um, they have these cool little straps that go around the bars when you're um, trying to attach a bar to the rig and maybe using it for low bar work like pull ups for little kids or some modifications for like um, bar muscle ups when you're trying to teach someone to do them. And you know how you wrap those rubber bands around the rig and the J hook to kind of keep everything straight. Well, they made straps for that and their straps kind of like the straps you use for rings. Um, they have a really secure um, system on it and you can wrap around the bar and keep that nice and secure. I love their innovation. Their, um, their product development team is top notch and they're just coming up with really um, different ideas for our space. So check them out at element26.co. That's element26.co. And tell them Kat sent you. Hey everyone, welcome to the Clydesdale Fitness and Friends. My name is Scott Switzer. I'm the Clydesdale. I'm your host. We love to do fitness. And I am here with a special friend, the baddest of badass women in the world. And that is Annie Sakamoto. Hi, Annie. Hi, Scott. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. First, before we get into anything, I have to say happy anniversary. You oh, celebrated 18 years yesterday, correct? 18 years yesterday. Yes. Thank you very much. So what I did you do? Somebody's put up with me that long. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you do to celebrate? Um, yesterday was kind of a really busy day for both of us. It was a Monday. We have a 15 year old daughter. Uh, she's a sophomore. She plays volleyball. We have an almost 13 year old son who's on a travel baseball team. So Yesterday, we did a lot of business, um, but Sunday, when my son and I got home from his baseball tournament, the whole family went out to dinner, and that was really fun. Jake and I, um, you know, we, we've been together 18 years, but I think probably our uh, one of our biggest pride and joys is our family and how much we like to be together, um, and so you know, call us unromantic. We really wanted the four of us to go out to dinner and we had this fantastic dinner. There was a ton of laughter. And it was perfect. Couldn't have asked yeah. for anything better. So I'm coming up on 25. Wow. Um, my right. daughter, my daughter is 20. And uh -huh. so we had those teenage years where anniversary dinners were the whole family. And it's, it's just been the three of us for a long time. So I totally get it. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's the fun way to celebrate. Now we're kind of getting on the other side of that as our daughter doesn't live at home anymore. And, right. and so now it's more just the two of us and it's kind of a different season of life and a little bit different getting used to. Yeah, definitely. I know. And that was the other thing for us. We're really just trying to, you know, savor all these years where they don't have a choice of if they right. get to be with us or not. Um, so yeah, it was good. Yeah. Is there a secret to 18 years of wedded bliss? <laughs> um, you know, I think a lot of it is, I, I, I'm, I'm really lucky. He's very supportive of all of the things that I want to do. Um, but then even more importantly, uh, he has a passion as well. And so we really bargain our time with each other. Um, and I think that that's really helpful. I think that, you know, if he didn't have a passion or things that he wanted to do. And I was always the one trying to do my training. <clears throat> it would feel a little more one-sided, but luckily he's very passionate about ocean sports. Um, and so we kind of have that bargaining power with each other. Uh, and then the other thing would probably be humor. We, we both, I mean, we just both love to laugh so much. So there's a lot of laughter in our house. Yeah. That's the key to everything. I think. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about this year. Um, it's been an amazing year for you. Um, let's talk about the season as it's kind of the new design of it. So first okay. time through the open with a quarterfinal. Now the masters, did they go right to the age group online qualifier, right? Correct. Correct. Um, 
So what did what were your thoughts on that one as an analyst, the season for elite individuals and for you as an athlete going through it this year? Um, I really liked it. I think that um, and I might even I'm going to start as an affiliate owner. Um, I really liked the open being three weeks. Uh, you know, we love the open. Uh, there's a lot of people in our gym that like to participate in the open. And I really want to support that because it definitely pushes people out of their comfort zone. <clears throat> On the other hand, you know, it's an ordeal every week, getting that workout done, getting everybody judged, making sure you have the space for it and not um, kind of offending or getting in the way of the people who don't want anything to do with the open. So the three weeks, I think, was very manageable as an affiliate owner. And also, you know, for your common everyday CrossFit athlete, by, the, by three weeks, you're still kind of excited about the Open. Fourth week, usually you kind of get a little, uh, and by the fifth week, if, you know, if you're not gunning for the games, if you're an everyday CrossFitter, you're kind of done. It's kind of hard to muster up the energy for that fifth week. So I think the three weeks um, as an athlete and as an affiliate owner was great. Um, and as an analyst, it, it, again, you just, you keep the energy, you know, it's like those fourth and fifth weeks can get a little tough to keep the energy sometimes. So I think less is more. Uh, and that's what this season was. Quarterfinals was, in my mind, a perfect stepping stone from uh, the Open because there's, there's this group of athletes that is not quite good enough to maybe make it to something like semifinals or regionals. But they're also, they're a little bit above your everyday average CrossFitter. And they're not done after three weeks or even sometimes after five weeks of the Open, right? They're still right. wanting more, but their season is over. So I think um, that's, you know, the quarterfinals really filled that niche for those athletes. Um, and then it gives us, as fans, a chance to see some new names and faces. You know, these, these people who might top a score, they may or may not make it to semifinals, but kind of some new names and faces. Um, and I think there's probably a lot of us as masters athletes that even qualified for the corner quarterfinals. And some of us chose to do them. Some of us chose not to do them, but I think that was great too. Um, <clears throat> and then obviously moving on to semifinals, it was very reminiscent of regionals, uh, which I think most of us just love. Uh, so that was, that was really fun. Um, and then, yeah. And then the age group online quarter or uh, online qualifier um, is always really good. I think this year, and I'm I'm actually fortunate enough to be on the athlete advisory council. And the one thing we did talk about is going forward. It might be nice if the quarterfinal um, team kind of quarterfinals and the age group online qualifier workouts were different in the event that a lot of these athletes want to participate in all three of those, um, you know, different stages, which really you could logistically, you could. So it might be a little more fun as an athlete. And even as an analyst, if there was a different set of workouts for all of those qualifications. It's funny when, when you were talking about the open three weeks, I never, this never even crossed my mind till we were talking. I I've gotten a tweak of a hamstring or a tweak of a calf or something in the open, like the last three years before this year, um, in that fourth and fifth week, I'm, you know, I'm 51. I'm not a yeah. spring chicken yeah. anymore. And you're right. I think like one, I'm just over it by week four and I probably don't warm up as much and I probably don't get in. And so it was leading to these little nick and nickel and dime injuries that um, yeah. I would get at the end of the open. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really think, and I could just see like the energy stayed um, really high in our gym on that third week. And it's definitely that fourth and fifth week that for the most part, it kind of starts to wane. So um, again, I think, you know, some people wanted more and that's how you want the, the, you know, your general population, you want them wanting more. They're, they're so excited for the next year to come around. So Let's jump to the semifinals. You were an analyst for that, doing yep. the studio show at, at HQ. Um, what were your thoughts on that as all the different programming? Um, it'd be cool if we had a full live year to really assess it. Um, but, but for the most part, got a good kind of taste of what it could be. 
I, I, yeah, I thought it was great. You know, I thought um, that the live events obviously were fantastic for not only the athletes, but for the fans, right? Like it really kind of pumped the fans up uh, for a live competition again. Um, and then, you know, obviously the virtual events weren't optimum, but they, I think CrossFit did their best considering um, all of the circumstances this year. Uh, I liked that it was standardized programming so that you really could kind of um, compare people across, you know, the different uh, semifinals. Obviously, it's just like, um, you know, in years past where some people get a couple more weeks to practice, others don't. Um, but I think yeah, I thought it was great. And I, I thought the programming at all the semifinals was good. I know that sometimes when it was um, the sanctional events, some of the events were just a little too kind of wild and out there. And I think the programming was really well done this year at all of the semifinals. Yeah, I actually, I went to all the North American semis. Um, oh, very cool. And it was, I, you know, I, this may not be a popular statement, but I have more fun at the semifinals than I do at the games. I could see it. I could 100% see it. Right. Um, as someone who does a podcast and, and I was working for Chalk Up for, for that part, um, you get way more access at the semifinals than you do at the games. People are much more relaxed at mm -hmm. semis than they are at the games. And it just seems like more of a good time, right? Definitely. Um, and and uh, you're I, a lot of up and coming athletes, you know, there's a lot of athletes that aren't sponsored yet that are really just working their butts off to be there and really appreciate the opportunity to be there. And, and that's fun to see. Yeah. I, I really had a blast. It, it's the first time I've done like the road trip thing with CrossFit and I just had a blast this year. Oh, that's awesome. So you qualify for the games uh huh, and uh, you did all right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so um, as I was kind of looking back at your career in 2016, you took second, mm -hmm. 2017, you took third, you were right. missing one color of metal. <laughs> Maybe and, the most important. Right? And you decided to complete that collection this year with yeah. a gold medal and a first place finish in the women's 45 to 49 division. Yep. Two event wins. Yes. Uh, and that might almost be my favorite part. I mean, obviously I loved winning the games, but even the year that I got, of all the years I've ever competed at the games, I had never had an event win. So I was really excited to get two event wins. So the important question is, what kind of shoes were you wearing? <laughs> Don't ask. <laughs> you know what though? It was almost like, I almost think if I had had on Reeboks, I probably would not have won. At least that's what I'm telling myself, Scott. Because <laughs> why make another couple grand, right? Right, right. Why? Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, that's kind of disappointing. Well, actually, <laughs> the funniest thing is um, the events... I could maybe see the rope climb event. Um, I'm a pretty, I'm pretty good at upper body strength. I wouldn't have thought that event with the sandbag, I would have won. So I don't, I, you know, I don't, I wouldn't have even thought about that. The one event that I thought I stood the chance to win was the swim. And I actually got third place on the swim. So, and I couldn't have worn my Reeboks anyway. Well, I could have, but it would have been a dumb place to wear them. So I don't know, anyways. I'll, yeah. I'll I'll take I'll take the the, the event win and write off that thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> well, I saw that. Um, so I was right there at the finish line um, while you were doing the chipper, uh, mm -hmm. and you know you're. It's so funny because you're kind of known as the nasty girl and the squat to the ball, and you proved pretty well that you didn't need the ball to assist you <laughs> on the squat because <laughs> uh, your squats are so fast. Thank you. Yeah. I have a, you know, a, a little less uh, uh, distance to travel, but yeah. <laughs> so I have to ask you, what were your highlights from this year's games? Um, definitely. Like I said, those, those two event wins were uh, huge for me. It was really exciting to finally get that. Um, and, and then uh, for me, actually seeing Jen um, Dieter Huser, Dieter right now now I forget to see her get third so she's somebody that I've competed with for a few years now and known for a few years um and she's always come really close she's she's a very worthy competitor she's you know she loves competing and she's always come really close to the podium but never ended up on it 
and we were going into the final event and we knew that she was really close and we knew that really she kind of had to win that event. We knew it was a strong event for her. Um, and I just remember rolling around on the floor with her when that thruster wall walk event was done and her saying, I think I did it. I think I did it. And her finally making it on the podium. And that was definitely a highlight for me. That's very cool. Yeah. Did you have any athletes uh, from your gym at the games? There were three of us that qualified as masters from one gym. Very so cool. I'm really proud of that. That's probably my other, um, my other highlight for sure is um, I was in the 45 division. Colette Cowan was in the 55 plus division and Marshall Delk was in the 65 plus division. So are you able to coach or help them uh, during the week or are you just too busy? So uh, Colette actually has Jason Lydon as her coach as well. Okay. Um, and so we're often training at the same time. We have different programming, but we, you know, we can bounce things off of each other. Sometimes our programming looks similar. Marshall actually just does our group classes, um, but Jason does the programming for our group classes. So oh. in essence, it, we, we were really three of Jason's athletes. That's awesome. Yeah. So then, you know, instead of celebrating like a normal person would after winning the games, you decide to go to work. <laughs> I did. I did. And so you throw the analyst hat back on and away you go to work your day job. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I feel really fortunate that, that that's even an option for me. Yeah. So, so what was that like? Were you a was it, did it help you ride the high of the, of the weekend or the week? Um, it, it, no, not necessarily. I mean, it, yeah, it was exciting to be up there, but it was so different. And I was actually really nervous because this was CBS sports. And I knew that Sunday we were doing CBS uh, live. Um, and I'm, I would say I'm probably more comfortable at this point competing than I am being at the desk. You know, I'm getting there at the desk, but the thought of being on CBS live on a Sunday afternoon was definitely a little unnerving. Um, but it was, it was a blast. It was, um, yeah, like I said, I just feel really fortunate. I know how much CrossFitters love media, love podcast, love anything where, you know, people are talking about CrossFit. So to be able to, uh, be a part of that is really an honor. It, it is so cool because what I find what I find amazing is last time we had you on, you talked about how uncomfortable you, you were competing. Yes. Right. Yeah. It, yeah. Early in your career that, you know, you there was the stigma as you were a nasty girl and you didn't want to, to taint that in any way. And and now you're very comfortable in competing. And now the, in the next phase of your life, you're you're in that uncomfortable spot again. Yep. Yep. It's Which, all about finding those uncomfortable spots, right? Right. Yeah. Get outside your box and be, make yep. yourself uncomfortable so that you can grow, right? Exactly. So, and you did well the first couple of times with that. So I'm sure you're going to keep doing well with this. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. So as a media person, what is the preparation like? Um, so you had to prepare to compete and you also had to prepare to be able to be, to speak intelligently about all the athletes and what was going on. Right. So we're, we're lucky. There's, um, there's a couple of different people, uh, namely Chad Schroeder, uh, who compiles all of this information for us um, as analysts and gives it to us on the athletes. And, you know, it's their, their um, history as far as games appearances, regionals appearances, sanctionals appearances, how long they've been crossfitting, what their, what their day job is. Um, and he compiles all of this information for us and, and gives it to us in digital format. Um, and then for me, like when I was on the plane out to Madison, uh, when I was in my hotel room, those early days that I was there, I'm just sifting through that information. What I actually did was kind of uh, like put it into my own document. Um, some, I, I use the document a bit, but a lot of that was just transferring that information. I was able to kind of process it better than if I had just read it. Um, and then it, I'll tell you the, the first 
day was a little hard because I'd been so focused on myself competing that I hadn't really watched the first day of competition because we were all competing on that Wednesday together, right. you know, separately, but everybody was competing. And so it was a little hard to kind of keep track of who was where that first day. Um, but then you know, again, we have all this information. We can actually, I'll, I'll periodically text Chad in the middle of something and be like, you know, where did this person finish at this and, and that? And how many times have they worn the white jersey or whatever it is? And he's great. He's, we definitely have some back end info coming to us. So I just picture you like as the events going on, scrambling through your notes as someone like unexpected does something like, okay, I got to know about this person. Is that what it's like? You know, a little bit, I would say that's probably more of what the color commentators have to do because they're announcing live, right? So they're, as somebody is making a move on the floor, they're needing in that moment to speak about somebody. So they definitely have it a lot harder than we do at the desk. At the desk, while the event's going on, we can be sifting through our notes, we're writing notes, um, but we usually have enough time by the time they come to us at the desk to, to have some information. A lot of what we're going to do is already formatted out. So often who we're going to talk about has already been figured out um, because they put B-roll, you know, they, they have highlight reels and whatever on these athletes. So unfortunately, sometimes who we end up talking about may or may not be who did well in an event. Um, because things obviously change in the event. A lot of times though, you know, ours is already very scripted, what we're going to talk about. And again, so that they can have highlight reels to those athletes. Okay. Well, that makes a lot of sense. And a little yeah. sneak peek behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, and so how much now you get through the CBS broadcast, mm -hmm. how did you feel at the end? <laughs> uh, okay. So, uh, I, I felt great. I actually wasn't nearly as tired or whatever as I thought I would be. Um, I flew home Monday. Our flight got all messed up in Phoenix. And so we had to get a new flight, yada, yada, whatever. I get home Monday evening. I went straight to work Tuesday morning. Um, and I, I had not been vaccinated yet. I went out on a limb and risked doing all that travel and not having been vaccinated. So I had, but I had an appointment for my, vac my first vaccine shot. So I go to work Tuesday, I go to work Wednesday. I get my vaccine on third. I go to work Thursday. I get my vaccine right after I was at work. And I was like, Oh, I kind of have a headache. And my son had gotten his first vaccine shot as well. We both kind of had a headache. I was like, Oh, that must be the first vaccine shot. The next day, Friday, we both felt really bad. And I was like, I have COVID, I just know it. And we went and the, him and I got tested and um, it, that was a whole debacle. We did a home, we, anyways, we ended up doing a home test on Saturday, all four of us, my husband, my daughter, who were both fully vaccinated, my son and I, who'd only had the first shot and him and I tested positive. So I never had a chance to celebrate because I literally like got home, went to work and within like three days of being home was flat on my back with COVID. <laughs> um, and him and I went down pretty hard. I think, you know, I don't know if the first vaccine shot exacerbated our symptoms because we had it and unknowingly, we, unknow we had it and then unknowingly having it got the first shot, but we went down pretty hard. So I went from hero to zero with no real time in between to celebrate wow. the hero. <laughs> Have you gotten your second shot? Yeah. So now my son and I are bulletproof, you know, cause now we're, <laughs> we're both fully vaccinated and have had COVID. Uh, so we're licking bathroom handles all over the place. <laughs> um, and, uh, um, but yeah, it was a, uh, it was a pretty wild month there. Yeah, I because I know when I got my second shot, I actually went down for two days, didn't have COVID, but it just it put me down ah. hard. Um, so yeah, I was wondering if you had the same effect or maybe you had already you had so many antibodies running through your body by that point. 
I definitely had a, a pretty bad headache for about a day. My son, he didn't, he had a little bit of a sore arm and that was it. He went down, he lost over 10 pounds. He had like a, when, when he had COVID, he had like an over 101 fever for 14 days straight. He was, he was a mess. So a funny story is I, you know, I was at the games. I ended up with bronchitis. I was in the urgent care on Thursday, I think, mm-hmm. uh, getting antibiotics. Um, and, th- and I actually got tested for COVID because I thought, man, I've come down with it. Yeah. And then ended up, we I drive home with some friends and we get home. And one of the friends I drove home with had COVID. So then I was getting tested when we got back to make sure that and I, and I've been vaccinated before I went, but I was like, man, for a vaccinated guy, I'm getting tested a lot. <laughs> <laughs> totally. totally. Yeah. Um, I, and I think, you know, some people definitely ended up with it, which makes sense. There was a lot of people in, in one space, but, um, you know, knock on wood, hopefully everybody's okay. And yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, we had, we did a show about, uh, best, best and worst from the games. Um, and most of the worst were just like logistical things that really the, the HQ or, or Dave or anybody really had no control over. And we thought that stuff was like, awesome. Like the programming was amazing. Right. Um, everything came off really well. It was just like water stations, um, right. stuff like that, that, that were, that were a little bit more of a hiccup than, than we would hope. Um, and, but we had a blast when we were there Definitely. and, and then when our buddy got the COVID, <laughs> And he was, he was, he was in quarantine for a long time. It took him way down. Yeah. yeah. Well, and again, you know, um, who knows if it was at the games, I mean, the travel, it's like those airplanes, you know, we're, we ended up on this tiny little flight from Phoenix to, to Monterey. And, you know, there's this moment when they serve you drinks and everybody's got their mask off and everybody's drinking for us. So who knows, who knows, right. you know, it was definitely uh, what I would say for me, is it was a it was a knowing risk that I was taking as far as just traveling, being there. Um, and I think that I would guess that most athletes vaccinated or not would have to say the same. Like if you're traveling there, if you're gonna be, you know, with all of those other people in the warm-up area, whatever, you're knowingly taking a risk. Um, that again, vaccinated or not. So I, yeah. I and I knew that. Well, let's talk about some other fun things you have going okay. on. And yeah. uh, so you mentioned Jason Lydon and he is your coach. Um, and how long have you, you and Jason been together? Um, we have been together since 2015. So about six years. Yeah. And Jason is also the coach for Ron Ortiz Yep. Uh, and several other athletes. I know my, one of my good friends, Dex Hopkins is with him as well. Yes, I love Dex. Um, and so uh, you guys held a master's camp. Was it a week ago, a week and a half ago, maybe now? It was, yeah, not this last Saturday. Or, yeah, not this last Saturday, but the one before that. And so what was the intent of that and how did it come about? Um, you know, when we got back from the games, Jason said, hey, I'm thinking about doing a master's camp. Um, just a one day workout, talk about programming, talk about breathing techniques, talk about stuff like mindset. Um are you guys in? And he also asked Chris Hinshaw if he would come and be a part of it. And, you know, Ron and I were like, oh yeah, definitely in. And then it was funny. I even had somebody, one or two people DM me and say, Hey, is this just for masters? And he had enough people say, Hey, why can't, why is this only for masters that he actually switched it last minute. And it was, you know, it was geared. It was a lot of masters athletes that were there, but um, there was a few young, young guns there as well. And so you, you, my understanding is you guys broke it kind of down into subjects throughout the day and, and either you or Ron or Jason would talk about or Chris. Really, um, Chris did a track workout to start, which was unbelievable. Uh, we got there and really, um, really Jason did all of the, the talk and the programming. Ron and I participated in all of the workouts. And then there was kind of a round table discussion at the end of the day where people could ask us questions about being games athletes. Is this something you think you'll do again in the future? I would do it in a heartbeat. Um, you, you know, it's a, it's really fun for me. It's fun for me to share my experience, any knowledge that I've gained. Um, and 
to be honest, you know, I don't get to see Jason most of the year and seeing him at the games is very different than uh, getting to hang out with him for a weekend. Um, and it was really special for me to get to have a weekend with him. Um, you know, and I, I, in a lot of ways, I like that um, I have to kind of be by myself and I have to figure things out by myself. Um, but it's, it's just a different dynamic when I'm training and he's right there with me. And it was, it was great to get some time with him. When I saw in one of your posts that you talk about him and you having a relationship deeper than just a coach athlete, that you guys are really good friends. And, um, can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah. Um, that was actually what drew me to him. I was at Power Monkey Camp. Um, I, I was, you know, about to kind of enter the master's division. I, I didn't know if I wanted a new coach. I knew I wanted to compete as a master. And um, our personalities just clicked so naturally. Um, you know, I like sarcasm. I like somebody kind of given me shit to me that that's means somebody likes me and, um, and, and vice versa. You know, I always tell people if I'm not giving you shit, that's when you should worry. Um, and we just had really good banter. And, and then I asked him if he would consider coaching me and he said, yes. And I just loved his programming, um, you know, as a master's athlete, as a mom, as a business owner. Um, but as somebody who's been in the sport for a long time, I haven't, I've, you know, a finite time, period that I can give to training every day. And as, as much as I want to do, as much as I can do, again, there is just this finite, finite amount of time that I have. And he's just always worked really well with that. He's known that he's never made me feel like I should be doing more. Um, and then, yeah, just throughout the years, uh, our banter and our personalities and the way we click has, has really solidified. And, um, yeah, I just really respect him. I have a lot of fun with him. And uh, he's definitely one of my absolute best friends in the whole wide world. Yeah, it's funny because, um, like I said, I'm, I'm good friends with Dex. And Dex talks about him in the same way. Yeah. Like that he's just one of the best dudes out there. And um, and he wouldn't have anybody else as his coach. Yep, exactly. I, you know, he, he can be anywhere from a complete shit talker, which I love, to just really caring and, 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 Hey, don't worry about that. Or, Hey, let me help you out with this. And, you know, he's somebody that I know he would lie down in the mud so I could walk over him uh, and not get my shoes dirty. And I, I 100% feel that about him and yeah, it's awesome. All right. I'm going to shift gears a little bit here. Okay. Um, last time I, we, I interviewed you, I had a shirt on that said, don't weaken. Yes. You said that that is your favorite shirt that is made out there. And I've noticed in like the documentary that was done about you, you're wearing one, um, you wear one a lot. So why does that speak to you more than anything else? Um, I think, uh, you know, even kind of what we were talking about earlier, I'd like to be challenged. I really do. And I think that actually that's, that's almost all CrossFitters, right? It's um, you could get a great workout at the gym by yourself. I think it's not even physically how CrossFit challenges us. It's really mentally how CrossFit challenges us. Um, and I, I kind of read the shirt that way too, is that yes, physically we're trying to stay strong, but so much of that comes from the mental challenge that CrossFit um, affords us a lot of times. Uh, and I'm in this for the long haul. I really want to be doing CrossFit when I'm 50, when I'm 55, when I'm 70, when I'm 85. Um, and so, for me, don't weaken is like, you know, keep your head in it, stay in this. And, and every day it's going to look a little different. Um, but that idea of just not giving up, not giving in to some of those little voices in your head really speaks to me. I love it. Yeah. So speaking of don't weaken, uh, there's an event coming up at the end of October called mm -hmm. the Rogue Invitational. And you were invited as a legend Yes. <laughs> so let me first say or ask you, what does that mean when you're called a legend? What does that mean to you? <laughs> it means I have this gray stripe in my head. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's, it's a huge honor. And I really appreciate that, you know, it's really easy to um, 
be excited about the, the new athletes in the sport, right? And your Tia's and your, um, you know, your Matt Frazier's and your Mal O'Brien's and all of these brand new athletes. Uh, and it's easy to forget the roots of the sport. Um, and then that, I don't fault anybody for that. That just is what it is. Uh, but I really appreciate that Rogue kind of, you know, gives a nod to some of the people who paved the way for some of these other athletes in the sport. You know, your Kristen Clevers uh, and your Rich Ronings, you know, back in the day when he was an individual, your Graham Holmberg's, just people like that, that, you know, if you got in the sport two or three years ago, you, you may or may not know who some of these people are. And if it wasn't for um, you know, Tanya Wagner and uh, Miko Salo, the sport wouldn't be where it is right now. So I really appreciate Bill and Katie and the road crew for honoring that. You know, it's crazy because I, I got into CrossFit in 2011, which is pretty early in the game. Ah. But I even had to go back and find out who Miko was. And I had to go back and find out who Tanya was. And just going back and kind of seeing what they did early on in the sport is just unreal. Right. And, you know, two years ago when Rogue was live, to get to see them out on the floor again was so cool. Yep. Yep. And, uh, you know, um, exactly. Like as a fan, um, it's really fun to see Miko out on the floor competing again. And just to know that he won the games and he's still doing CrossFit and he's still passionate about it. And um, he can still throw down it's awesome. And, you know, that may be where our sport uh, sets itself apart a little bit too, is, um, is that, you know, you, you may or may not see Allen Iverson still out on the basketball court and, you know, it, it's, but you can see Miko out on the field competing and that's pretty awesome. Yeah. And, um, and what's cool is like, they had that opportunity. The men took last time where every champion lined up and they took that picture. Yep. You know, and now other than Justin, like there's that picture that stands of every CrossFit champion that has ever existed. Yeah. Super cool. Yeah. And you don't get those moments every day. Right. Nope. And, and so I'm excited. I'm, I, I just bought my ticket for Austin uh, this, this afternoon. Excellent. And so I can't wait to be there for that. And I'm actually working with the rogue media team uh, down there. So I get to learn some stuff from them and I'm so very stoked. cool. Yeah. Yeah, and well, so Oak just does everything right. You know, I've I've had the the um, benefit of working with them on the Iron Game a couple of times, and just everything that Bill and Katie do is is just the best way you can do things. They're such stand up, stand out uh, business owners, community members, uh, fans of the sport, and for me, anytime I get a chance to work with them, for them, be around them, I would take it in a heartbeat. And I, I talked to Matt Chan a couple months ago, and he was talking about how this event lets him hang out with his friends again. Totally. Right. Like Matt has moved on to do some other crazy fitness related things that, that aren't necessarily CrossFit. Um, but once, once a year, he gets to go hang out with his friends again. Yep. And, and he's so stoked about that. Exactly. All right. So we have talked about all the cool stuff CrossFit. And the main reason... <laughs> The main reason I wanted to have you back on is after we interviewed you the last time, I found out that we share a passion for something and it is vinyl. Yes. And for you younger people, that means records, um, <laughs> LPs, uh, LPs, these big things. Yes. Like this. Uh, this is one of my prized ones. Yeah, this I is actually the say. original cover of 1999. That's not, amazing. Not the bubble version. Right. Um, and so I am, that's one of mine. But I saw that Annie kept taking these videos of her record playing and putting it on Instagram. And I started commenting and I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. I got to have you on to talk about your record collection. So the first question is, when did you start? Okay, so um, when I was in my early 20s, I went to the flea market here in Santa Cruz. And I walked in and this guy had all these boxes of records. Uh, and I was like, oh, how much are the records? You know, and he said, I'll sell you a whole box for 20 bucks. And it probably had 50, 75 records in it. Right. And I was like, and he said, you can't pick or choose. You know, you, it just, you buy the box or you don't. And I was like, 20 bucks. All right. Gave the guy 20 bucks and walked out with some records. 
And I actually, to be honest, Scott, I, I never really played them. I looked at a couple of them and I ended up just putting them in my, in my parents' garage. Um, but I grew up like my, we had a record player, you know, um, growing up. And I remember listening with my mom to like um, Hall and Oates or just having records playing, you know, in the evenings uh, when we were around. And anyways, I, and I always loved the sound you know, of the needle right when it hits the record and just this, that crackle that it has. So for whatever reason this year, I, I like looked at my husband. I was like, I know what I want for my birthday. I want a record player. And he was like, what? And I was like, I have all these old records and I want to like, I want to finally listen to them. He was like, all right. So he goes and finds a record player. And I told my mom, all I want for my birthday this year is for you to find that box of records in the garage okay fine whatever she was cute she put them in like milk crates you know because it was an <laughs> old deteriorated box and she put them in milk crates and jake finds this this record player and i'm like oh god it's ugly i don't like it i want like a cool retro looking one so i found like one of those urban outfitters ones uh, that kind of has a cool look to it well the bummer about those is i might as well have ordered a fisher price right, right. i mean this so I do need to get a better record player. But then I start sifting through these records and I was like, oh my gosh, I have, I think, at least three Beatles albums. I have uh, like two or no, I have three of Fleetwood Mac. I have, I'm going to, I'm going to take you over to my collection, but I get like Cindy Lauper, uh, Peter Gabriel. So, and all of a sudden oh. I, was like, I have the most amazing <laughs> record collection. Um, and so I've just been, you know, periodically putting one on, finding one and going through them. And it's been a blast. So the funny thing that what got me into record collecting was my daughter. My daughter really? wanted to start collecting she wanted to buy vinyls instead of cds or digital she wanted to have something and she's an, she's a photography major so like art is her and with the albums you get the art right yeah exactly so How we started she, and she got into it uh like 16 15 or 16 that is so, so cool so probably for the last five years like we would go to record store day we would go if we found an old record shop we would go in together and just start buying stuff um and her collection is way bigger than mine. Like she probably has 200 records. Wow. That is so cool. Um, but uh, some of the finds I had, like the thing that was cool is like, I don't know if you remember these guys. Sticks. Sticks. Yes. And look at, yours are all in really good shape. Mine were from this box. So I have like queen. But I have to show you oh. the cool stuff about records. Uh, how about this one? The police synchronicity. Oh, that's so good. So do you remember when they did uh, the hologram on the record? I hope it picks it up. Oh, yes. Like it actually has the album title on. That is so cool. Uh, I, no, I don't remember that. So that that was pretty cool. Um, that uh. was... And then this is the first album I ever bought as a kid. Wow. Look, you've kept him in good shape. And that one, I wanted Sticks Grand Illusion, but I couldn't afford it with my allowance. So I got that one out of the bargain bin. <laughs> <laughs> no way. Yeah. And that was like the first album I ever bought. And so do they have, like, is there a cool record shop where you are? So there's a city uh, just north of us called Delaware. Uh -huh. just north of Columbus. And there's a guy there who is such a hippie and he owns a record store and it's got couches and record players in it. So you can listen to the records. That's cool. And then, and then he just has bins and bins of records for you to go through and people like can trade them in, buy them. So you can get them uh, old uh, and he has brand new ones that he orders in. That is really cool. I have a friend, my son's best friend, they were just taking their daughter down to school at UC Santa Barbara. And she said the hotel that they stayed in every, I, I think every room had a record player in it. And the lobby, there was a big selection of records and you could go down and grab a record and bring it up to your room and play it. That is Isn't so that cool. cool. How about this one? Oh my gosh. That was in that box. Yeah. 
Uh, no, there, there's a chance I owned a couple and that okay. may not have been in it. But what I think is funny is like you mentioned Peter Gabriel. So you mentioned police synchronicity, like those evoke memories and emotions in me just right. hearing those names. Yep. And I think that's what the coolest thing about walking into a record shop is. Yes. I, I mean, I obviously like for you and me, like you said, it's very nostalgic, the music itself. Um, and, and for me, a lot of it, like probably the sticks and I have like a lot of um, Eagles and stuff like that. It, it Leonard Skinner. To me, like that stuff should be on vinyl. Like you should right. like, you have a crackle in the background when you listen to it. Like it was meant to be there. Yep. I have Rolling Stone, some girls. Wow. Yeah. That's, and that they don't look bad. They look like they're in good shape. Yeah, they're, they're a little beat up on the sides, but I'll take it. Yeah, but they should be. Yes, exactly. They should be. Yep. Um. I think that's the coolest thing when you walk into these record shops and I don't know if you have them, I'm sure you have them in California, Yeah. but when you walk in, you don't know what's going to be there. Right. Right. So it's like this, I'm on the hunt and what, what is going to be sparked in my memory today? Yep. Totally. So what, what have you been playing lately? Cause I don't want to ask you the favorite question. I've done that before. And you were like, I can't pick. I know. Um, so unfortunately, since I was posting all of those uh, on my on my story, we've gotten so crazy busy. So for me, I really like to put an album on while I'm making dinner. Um, that's just really fun. Or, or Jake will pick an album, and um, and you know the fun thing about albums is you don't get to FF right. Like you you sit yep. and you listen to every song, um, and that's been really fun. Unfortunately, uh, fortunately, unfortunately, our kids have been so busy with sports that we're not getting home till late at night. We're you know we're I'm making dinner at funky times so that it's ready when we get home. So I haven't listened to a lot lately um also we haven't been home on the weekends because that's the other time that i'll definitely listen to it uh so i don't know i'm inspired to put one on though this afternoon yeah it's funny because my record player is in the podcast center um Uh because this is where i was working from home as well Um, but i've actually moved my office upstairs um, and i just bought a new stand to put my record player on and to hold all my records so it can be right beside my my new desk and stuff upstairs. Very cool. And so and I can listen while at work. Like a good record player with the just like you. I have everything. I have I have the Fisher Price model. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for now it's okay. And but I eventually I want to get a nice one. Same here. Now my best friend has like the one that you put the record on up high and you pull the thing back, it drops, the needle automatically goes onto the record and it, he's got like an equalizer and speakers and. Right, right, which is pretty cool, right? Yeah, and so when when my daughter and I got into it, then he started getting into it and now he, he's got a huge collection. I love it. And yeah, I probably he- got the smallest of the three. <laughs> And you started it. It's just, I feel like it is a really fun thing to collect, you know? And like you said, it's the album covers. It's, it's everything. It's really fun. Have you got sucked into record store day yet? Not yet. Not yet. Yet. Which is a bummer because we have a couple really good record stores here in Santa Cruz. Yeah. So they, um, so every year on, I think it's in the spring, they do record store day and they bring out special editions of things. So I have um, Elvis's 68 comeback special on, on vinyl. That is two out, two records. One is the East coast recording. And the second one is the West coast recording, which are different that they broadcast on TV back then. And there's only like 2,500 of them in, in existence. No way. So that's what they do on record store days. They make these little short runs of things. Yes. Um, and so you can get like a collector's item of it. And that's where you really get sucked in. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Yeah. You know, Santa Cruz is funny too. Like, you, you know, we were saying there's so many old hippies and stuff here that there's often somebody that just sits. We have like this outdoor mall downtown and there's um, somebody that just sits there and sells records and they have a, a good, you know, couple hundred records for sale right there just on the street. Yeah. That's what I love. Yeah. I love just sifting through the box. Yep, exactly. 
seeing yeah. what you can find. Well, this has been a super fun conversation. I I'm agree. so glad we got to have it. So what are your plans uh, for next competition season? Are you going to do both again? Um, so I'm not, I'm kind of going one day at a time. Uh, you know, for me, I, I just love training. Um, and so I think that I would train like I was going to the games, like I wanted to qualify for the games, even if it wasn't necessarily my optimum goal or my ultimate goal, um, because I just love training so much. And a lot of that ties back to Jason and our relationship. And I just, you know, I really, he makes training so fun for me. Um, I may, I, I just got a little message from Wadapalooza um, that they were going to give me an invite and I've never been to Wadapalooza and I've always really wanted to go to Wadapalooza and it's their 10th anniversary this year. So I may have to, uh, if I do get the invite, I may have to try that one out this year. That's in January. Um, I'll definitely do, do the open barring any unforeseen circumstances and then just kind of go by feel from there. Um, you know, it, and again, Jason's really good. It's, it is a big commitment to qualify for the games, even as a master's athlete and to do well at the games. And, you know, if I qualify, I don't want to just show up and, you know, say thanks for the ticket. I want to win it or, or, you know, come as darn near close as I can. So um, having two kids that are really involved in their own sports right now, it's a little tough. Um, but I'll just take the season as it comes and see how I'm at and how I'm feeling and where my kids are at and, um, everything is, and, you know, hopefully, yeah, I'll be there again. Yeah. And you're in that spot where your kids are in that, just in the high school age where yep. it gets like, you thought it was chaotic before. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. It yeah, gets like nobody drives, but everybody has a thousand places that they need to be. Yeah. When my daughter got her license, like our whole life changed. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That was exactly. like an, an oh, day. Exactly. Exactly. And again, these are happy problems, right? Like my kids right. are in sports and um, so it's good. And, but I just don't want to miss those years because I'm competing. Yeah. I totally get it. So I'm going to ask you another question about music. Okay. So we just talked about all these records, right? If you had to pick one record to play while you're working out. Mm. I would probably choose like a, a maybe a Led Zeppelin or a Leonard Skinner. Yeah, I really, you, I, you I can't like, FF, you can't FF. So you got to play. I know, out. Right. Um, I really do like, especially for that. I like some, um, you know, I, I like hip hop. I have to say I don't, but I don't own any hip hop albums, I need to go buy some. So of, of my collection, um, I do also really like Led Zeppelin. Yeah, yeah. It's what my, uh, me, oh gosh. I, I, when I'm working out, I like something that totally blocks my mind off and it's like really heavy. Okay. Not like screamy heavy, it's gotta be melodically heavy. Yes. Um, uh, like a hailstorm or, um, sound or, uh, sound garden. So okay. I would go sound garden. I like it. I like it. That would be cool. Yeah. A good sound garden album. That would be good. Yes. But I was going to say my best friend's wife, you know, he started the collection where she started to get old school hip hop albums because he had the record player now and was playing these records all the time. So she actually started a collection too of these old school, like nineties hip hop. Yes. That's, that's what I want to add to my collection. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's, what's so cool about music. You can go in so many different directions. Totally. And still enjoy every bit of it from Led Zeppelin to Levert, you know, <laughs> Levert. Good one. I love it. A little R and B there, right? Yeah, 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 awesome stuff. Well, Annie, my gosh, you are one of my favorite people to talk to. You're this so is sweet. thank you. This has been a blast, and hopefully, we can do this again in the future. Let me know. Um, and will I see you at Rogue? One hundred percent, you will. Awesome. I will see you there. Thank you so much awesome. for jumping on with me. Thank you, Scott. Thanks for asking me. <laughs>